Uh, this is a lecture that I call Rationalizing Initial Therapy of Hypertension. So essentially what we're going to discuss over the next um, 45 minutes is you have a bevy of antihypertensive medications that you can prescribe. How do you choose which one to start? And this allows us to get into some of the basic, very simplistic physiology that we think is driving hypertension in so many adults. You're going to get an amazing lecture later today from Dr. Alicati on the specific uh, physiology of salt's role in hypertension. I'm going to just touch upon that here in this talk, and then you'll get that expanded upon later today. Um, so let's get right to it. So rationalizing your initial treatment choices, first choice of, of blood pressure medicine or blood pressure management for your patient. So we'll talk about what's the case for starting with the diuretic. What's the case for starting with a renangiotensin aldosterone system blocking drug? What's the case for combination therapy right off the bat? What's the case for using dietary and lifestyle modifications? And then we'll leverage that in terms of how you might use those decision-making processes later on in the natural history of hypertension when you're facing a patient with resistant hypertension. And again, it's all based on the physiology that we think is driving hypertension. So where are we in terms of what goals we're shooting for when we treat patients with hypertension and who are we labeling as hypertension has been influenced greatly by the SPRINT trial. And I'm sure I'm not the only lecturer today who will talk about the SPRINT trial, but this trial, which is now uh, amazingly seven years old, really changed uh, our definition of, of treatment goals and who we're labeling hypertension. And as you see, it influenced guidelines. So just to remind you, the SPRINT trial had two arms. One was to a standard blood pressure goal of essentially less than 140 systolic. And then the other was a more intensive blood pressure goal where they were basically getting patients to systolics below 125. And what they saw in that trial was that the group that was intensively treated to lower blood pressure goals than the current guidelines at the time were achieving better primary outcome measurements. And th these were hard primary outcomes, cardiovascular events and death. And that was the reason why we needed to get a new guideline pretty quickly after the SPRINT trial was published. So two years after SPRINT, we have a new set of guidelines from a, from a number of different uh, organizations, including the American College of Cardiology and the American Society of Hypertension, which essentially says that high blood pressure that requires treatment or management begins at 130 over 80, and that the goal blood pressure for all of our patients should be less than 130 over 80 with this elevated sort of prehypertensive state at 120 systolic. So lowered our goals, which were previously 140 over 90 to 130 over 80. And that was actually a really big change in terms of who we labeled as hypertensive. So just with that one change in guidelines, we saw in the United States an additional 31.1 million Americans being labeled as hypertensive and requiring treatment that were not labeled as so under the pre-existing guidelines. And with that new diagnosis of hypertension requiring management, we actually saw additional pharmacologic therapy for many of these patients. And so in your clinics, you're seeing more and more patients who are meeting that threshold that will require some degree of antihypertensive management. And so how are you going to choose the best way to manage hypertension in these patients? So we're going to start with the case for a diuretic. And this is a very nephrocentric view of hypertension, but um, we do think this is the primary reason for the majority of patients who have essential hypertension, that they have some impaired ability in the way the kidney handles salt. And that's why these patients are becoming hypertensive. This is probably something that is inherited. It's not a single genetic uh, inheritance. You're going to hear a lot more about genes later today in a talk by Dr. Nestor. This is sort of a, a, a multimodal inheritance. And sometimes the impaired kidney function can be overt. You know, somebody has chronic kidney disease, of course, their kidney can't handle salt loads. But the overwhelming majority of patients with essential hypertension uh, have, normal, have normal kidney function. So this is an occult inability of the kidney to efficiently handle salt loads. And what happens is that the, the kidney, and specifically the nephron's inability uh, 
to efficiently excrete all the salt that's coming in through the diet leads to the risk of becoming volume overloaded. And the way the body responds is to increase filtration of sodium via increased hydrostatic pressure within the glomerular capillary loop. And the way it does that is by raising peripheral blood pressure. And by raising peripheral blood pressure, you eventually can filter out more sodium. You can restore sodium balance so you're net even, but you do so at the cost of being hypertensive. So just to review, the theory says you begin with a, an inability or a defect in excreting salt, what we call a natriuretic defect. In response, you have to raise peripheral blood pressure so that you can filter out more, more salt through the nephron and keep your, your body in net even salt balance. And you're doing so at the cost of being hypertensive. And that's why if this is the main cause of hypertension for our patients, that's why salt restriction or diuretics are such a logical choice of therapy because you're essentially removing the initial salt load that can't be excreted or if you're not able to salt restrict but use a diuretic, you're basically giving the kidney a boost in excreting sodium so that you can get into salt balance and maybe do so at, at, at a better blood pressure than would be the case without a diuretic. So you'll often hear nephrologists use a term that says blood pressure follows the kidney. And essentially what we're saying here is blood pressure follows the kidney's ability to handle salt loads. So this has been shown beautifully in animals. If you take a genetically hypertensive prone rat, and transplant its kidney to a normotensive rat, the normotensive rat will become hypertensive. And if you do the reverse experiment and take a normotensive rat and transplant its kidney into the hypertensive rat, the rat will become normotensive. And this is not through any change in diet or medication. It's just because of the difference in the kidney itself. And that really is the purest way to show how important kidney function is to maintain blood pressure and specifically, it's the kidneys handling of salt that we're transplanting in and out of these rats. Now, we do this experiment in humans as well. So if you do a kidney transplant, this is a famous example. This is um, the playwright Neil Simon got a kidney from his publicist, Bill Evans. This was in the New York Times. So this is a, f a famous example of blood pressure following the kidney because if you have a dialysis patient who has four or five blood pressure medication requirements, and lost their kidney due to hypertension, and then gets a kidney from a young, healthy individual, and that kidney works perfectly when you transplant it in, you would expect that when they leave the hospital with normal kidney function, they may not need any blood pressure medicines. Blood pressure, again, following kidney function. So when you have someone who's hypertensive, essentially what you're saying is that like this genetically hypertensive prone rat, there is a defect. There is a... a, a weak kidney response to salt loads. Now, it's a little bit more complicated in terms of what exactly is going on because we, we, we actually have learned that it's not just the kidney, but it's other organs involved in this response to salt loads. And uh, the most exciting advances have been in understanding what we call the gastrorenal access. Now, this is essentially a term that describes the communication between the GI tract and the kidney in response to salt loads. And one of the most you know, surprising things is if you look at the excretion of salt in our urine, you will get a greater and more rapid naturesis, excretion of salt, after ingesting an oral sodium load compared to doing an intravenous load. And that's sort of against a lot of things we think about in terms of how medications are delivered. We always think that intravenous is a faster response than oral. But if you take the same amount of salt and drink it versus infusing it through the IV, you'll get the salt excretion faster if you ingest it orally. And that's because of this very quick and efficient communication between the gut and the kidney, what we call the gastrorenal axis. And it turns out the hormone that's doing that communication is a hormone called gastrin. Gastrin is expressed in the brain, it's expressed in the GI tract, and it's expressed in the kidney, specifically in the proximal and distal parts of the nephron. When you infuse gastrin into an animal, you actually see less and less sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule 
the fractional uh, sodium absorption goes down. And conversely, then you see much more salt getting put out into the urine. You're essentially using gastrin in an experiment like this, like a diuretic, to push out salt into the urine. And if you block gastrin, if you block its receptor, you no longer get that natriuresis. If you do genetic experiments where you knock out gastrin from a mouse, you won't get a natriuresis after you ingest food. And not surprisingly, those gastrin knockout mice have a very salt-sensitive hypertension phenotype. So going back to this model we talked about, that blood pressure follows the kidney, what we really might be saying here is that if somebody is genetically prone to hypertension, not only do they have a salt excreting defect, they may have a defect in the gastrorenal axis, where someone who's able to maintain normal tension has an intact, fully functioning gastrorenal axis, where the communication between the gut and the kidney is efficient in being able to say, we've gotten the salt load here, we need to efficiently get it out before we go into positive sodium balance. And so this is a, a beautiful experiment in animals where they compare these two types of rats, the WKY or Worcester Kyoto rats are normotensive rats and the SHR are spontaneously hypertensive rats or genetically prone to be hypertensive. And you can see that only the normotensive rat actually, sorry, actually responds to the gastrin in terms of increasing the urine output in terms of volume and increasing the urine sodium excretion in terms of filtering out sodium, whereas the hypertensive rat is in a, in, has an inability to respond to gastrin in terms of increasing salt excretion in the urine. It looks like the majority of the effect is on uh, sodium potassium ATPase activity in the proximal tubule, which is where so much of sodium reabsorption occurs. So in a uh, normotensive individual or a normotensive rat in this experiment, the response to gastrin is to turn off that sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule and force sodium into the, into the urinary space and get rid of sodium and reestablish salt loads. That inhibitory effect of gastrin on the sodium potassium ATPase does not occur in a hypertensive rat, and we would think consequentially is not occurring in hypertensive humans. So again, if you think about this defective gastrorenal axis as being the root of hypertension, it makes so much sense to basically reduce the salt in your diet. If it's all starting by an inability from the GI tract to send a message to the kidney to get rid of salt, well, let's stop the, the initial signal. Let's reduce the salt that the GI tract is seeing. And it turns out that the worse your hypertension is, the more profound salt restriction will be in terms of reducing blood pressure. So if you take a non-hypertensive and you significantly reduce the salt to less than two grams a day, it's a modest effect on blood pressure. If you take a well-controlled hypertensive, it's a little bit more impressive. But if you take a resistant hypertensive patient, the blood pressure lowering effect of salt restriction is remarkable. So what that says to me is that as you move from non-hypertensives to mild hypertensives to severe hypertensives, you are seeing a more and more pronounced salt excreting defect, and that needs to be addressed. So unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of, of Americans are eating far too much salt. So if you look at self-reported salt intake, which has always been under-reporting salt intake, but if we just take patients at their word when they fill out dietary questionnaires, and this is from a large dietary questionnaire um, put out by the, by the Ann Haines survey, over 90% of Americans are eating more than the recommended salt intake. And it basically goes through all age groups, all subgroups in terms of populations. Um, and if you try to average how much each group is, is eating, um, 19 to 50 year olds are eating about 3.8 grams of sodium per day. And over the age of 50, about 3.3 sodium grams per day. Now, as I said, this is what they are reporting to eat. Now, it turns out patients don't usually know how much salt they're eating. So this is from a, a study done at the Cleveland Clinic where they asked patients how much salt they were eating, and then they did uh, an approximate dietary sodium measurement by looking at 24-hour urine sodium excretion, which is a good measure of how much salt patients are eating. Although you will hear a little bit later from Dr. Alicati, it's not a perfect measurement, which is why I say approximate dietary sodium. 
So if the patient tells you that they eat no salt, they never add salt, they avoid salty foods, they tend to eat about two to three grams per day. So still above the goal that you would want for a hypertensive patient. If they say they eat salt, but only in moderation or very little salt, they barely add salt, just a pinch, three to five grams per day. And unfortunately, really the only patient report that we can reliably say is accurate is a patient who admits to using a lot of salt and those patients are eating more than five grams a day. So we clearly have a lot of room to improve sodium intake uh, for our patients. But since so much salt is in processed foods, that is a very hard goal for many of our patients to reach. Unless you are making most of your food yourself, which is very hard for busy adults, you're gonna be eating a lot of salt via processed food, which is why diuretics are also a very logical place to start in terms of treating a hypertensive patient. Because again, if it's a salt excreting defect and you can't remove the salt, let's try to help the defect. Let's give a drug that sort of helps the kidney get rid of salt uh, more efficiently, which is what a diuretic does. And if you look at you know very, very large meta-analyses of hypertension trials, diuretics have always done very well as first-line agents. They always beat placebo. They often beat other drugs like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, even ACE inhibitors. Um, so they've always really performed well as first-line agents, especially if you're using good diuretic dosing. So if you look at some of the studies that you know established diuretics as appropriate first-line agents, uh, most of them were using thiazides, although most of them were using thiazides that we don't normally start with, like chlorthalidone and dipamide, or using higher doses of hydrochlorothiazide than we typically start with, you know, up to 50 milligrams a day, rather than the 12 and a half to 25 that many people are starting with. But again, appropriate diuresis has always been shown to be an effective first-line antihypertensive agent. So again, some of it comes down to choice of diuretic. As I mentioned, the, the studies that sort of put diuretics in a firm position as an appropriate first-line agent tended to use higher doses than what we typically see in common practice with hydrochlorothiazide. And chlorthalidone, which was one of the main ones used in some of these studies, is essentially a more powerful medicine than hydrochlorothiazide because of pharmacokinetics. If you look at um, the comparison of equal doses of hydrochlorothiazide and chlorthalidone, when you dose in the morning, the drop during the daytime is about the same, but chlorthalidone continues its blood pressure lowering effect, whereas hydrochlorothiazide, if it's not dosed as a BID drug, loses, it, loses its effect at nighttime, and that translates to worse 24-hour control. And you'll hear later on from others about why it's so important that the blood pressure continues to dip while we're sleeping, and if it's not dipping, that puts you at higher risk for cardiovascular events. So um, if for those who have said, well, diuretics seem too weak, it may be that you're choosing the wrong diuretic or you're dosing the diuretic at too low of a dose. Okay, so that's the case for starting with salt restriction or a diuretic. And that's specifically addressing the salt excreting defect that we think is at play for so many patients. The next thing I want to talk about here is what if you want to start with a renal angiotensin aldosterone system blocking agent? And there's a good case for this too. It's a good case based on both physiology and evolution. So if we start by getting to the, the history of renal angiotensin aldosterone system blocking drugs, we, we learned that the first ACE inhibitor, the first ROS blocking agent, Captopril, was developed out of the viper of the Brazilian pit viper um, out of the venom of the Brazilian pit viper, um, who, uh, whose official name is Bothrops jararaca. So the question would be, well, why does a snake have a ACE inhibitor in its venom? Most snake venom, I don't want to get too much into snake venom, but most snake venom, the way it kills or hurts individuals is as an anticoagulant, where you make somebody bleed out. But this snake, the way it kills or injures its victims is by giving an ACE inhibitor. So why would that be effective? Well, one of the ways you could try to figure it out is who would be the natural prey. Now, it turns out there was a group of, of individuals called the Yanomamo who lived in the same area as this Brazilian pit viper. And up until recently, they had not been westernized. They were very similar to the way our 
uh, our ancestors thousands of years ago lived in terms of following a hunter-gatherer diet. And this group was studied extensively by anthropologists in the 1970s as a classic no-salt hunter-gatherer culture. And when the group profiled them in the 70s, what they found was that they relied on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system to maintain normal tension. Their average blood pressure was 90s to low 100s over 50s to 60s. So really pristine low blood pressures. When they profiled their renin angiotensin aldosterone system, they had exceedingly high levels of aldosterone. So the upper limit of normal for 24-hour urinary aldosterone excretion in the urine, depending on the lab, is anywhere from 10 to 15. Most people say if it's above 12, it's elevated. So you're looking at levels that are more than six times the upper limit of normal. And then similarly, renin levels. Uh, again, most places will call a plasma renin activity greater than two elevated. So again, more than six times the upper limit of normal. So these individuals had super high renin, super high aldosterone, in essence, an extremely revved up renin angiotensin aldosterone system just to maintain normal tension. And that makes sense because there's so little salt in their diet, they need to maximally conserve salt to maintain that blood pressure. That's why they needed so much renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity. And if you gave them an ACE inhibitor, captopril, or you bit them with a snake whose venom has captopril, you're going to go from 90 over 60 to basically shock. So from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense why the snake developed an ACE inhibitor in its venom. Evolution tells us something else. We know the story about thrifty genes, where we say well, the reason why we see so much obesity and so much diabetes now is because we have genes that are maladaptive in trying to extract the maximum caloric uh, output from food because our ancestors had limited food supplies. And now in the setting of ample food supplies, those genes are maladaptive. It's making all of us obese and diabetic. Similar story here. Our ancestors were on low salt diets. We have genes that program our renin angiotensin aldosterone system to be hyperactive in the setting of low salt. But now we're in an ample salt diet. We just showed you that over 90% of us are eating too much salt, and many of us are eating more than five grams of salt per day. So these genes now become maladaptive. We're holding on to way too much salt, and what's gonna happen? Well, what's gonna happen is that if you have a hyperactive renin angiotensin aldosterone system without salt, you will be fine. We know that from the experience with the Yanomamo. We also know it from one of nature's experiments called Gittleman syndrome, which is a salt wasting defect in the kidney where you basically can't reabsorb salt and you put out salt in the urine. And those patients have very low blood pressures and really don't get any cardiovascular outcomes as long as their electrolytes are kept in good place. But if you have that same hyperactive renin angiotensin aldosterone system and you start adding salt to the mix, and remember 90% or more of us are eating too much salt, that hyperactive renin angiotensin aldosterone system is not okay. It's maladaptive. And what modern hypertension is, is our kidneys attempt to reconcile that mismatch between conserved overactivity of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and high salt intake. How do we do that? It goes back to pressure naturesis. By raising peripheral blood pressure, you can reestablish salt balance, but you do so at the cost of being hypertensive, and eventually you do so at the cost of hypertension-associated cardiovascular and kidney injury. So we use a term often in our practice called relative hyperaldosteronism, and you could actually say relative hyper renin angiotensin aldosterone system, but it's hard to say it so quickly. So we just use the term relative hyperaldosteronism because the experiments that were done to show this really measured aldosterone as the marker of renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity. If you take normotensive individuals and you load them up with salt, if you just give them more and more salt per day, this is milligrams of sodium per day. If you just keep giving them more and more, you'll see that they suppress their aldosterone secretion and they do so very quickly and very efficiently. If you take a hypertensive patient and you do the same experiment and just load them up with salt, they also suppress but they never suppress to the same degree as a normotensive individual. 
Now, these levels of aldosterone are within the normal range, so they won't be flagged by a lab as being high, but they're relatively high compared to what a normotensive would do. So that's why we call it relative hyperaldosteronism. And we see this so commonly in hypertension. In fact, if you profile aldosterone levels in normotensive individuals, and then you follow these patients over a four-year period, the group with the lowest normal levels of aldosterone has the lowest risk of progressing to hypertension. And the group in the fourth quartile with the highest levels of aldosterone still in the normal range. So this is just looking at the spread of aldosterone levels within the normal range of aldosterone. That group has almost a 20% chance of developing hypertension over the next four years. We also know that once you are hypertensive, the degree of aldosteronism that you're expressing is associated with worse hypertension. So stage one, stage two, stage three, these are old JNC6 classifications of hypertension, but they go from mild, moderate to severe hypertension. You see more and more of this relative hyperaldosteronism at play. And then this is a very recent study um, that does a similar sort of cross-sectional view of different types of hypertension from normotension to stage one to stage two to resistant hypertension using some of the newer um, 2017 classifications of blood pressure. And you can see that as the blood pressure gets worse, you're seeing more and more aldosterone expression and more and more biochemically overt aldosteronism. This is a particularly problematic situation in our patients who are obese with the metabolic syndrome. And this may include up to about one out of every three adult patients that you see in terms of meeting BMI criteria for obesity. So what happens when you're obese? Well, you, have, you have a double hit. So obesity, because it's an expanded volume state, actually leads to hyperfiltration at the glomerulus and some hypertrophy at the proximal tubule. So you actually have more active proximal tubular function that leads to more avid reabsorption of sodium to expand the extracellular volume. At the same time, the adipocytes themselves are able to secrete something called adipokines, which have never been fully elucidated what exactly these hormones are, but what we know is that these hormones actually stimulate the adrenal gland to produce from the zona glomerulosa aldosterone. So you're getting a signal on one hand to avidly reabsorb salt. You're getting a signal on the other hand to the adrenal gland to overproduce aldosterone. And so you have this combination of high aldosterone and high salt, which is particularly deleterious to the kidney, which is my area. And I see this lesion of focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. But the same thing is happening if you looked at myocardial cells, you get cardiac fibrosis as well. When we talk about blood pressure being salt sensitive, and again, you'll hear a beautiful lecture later today from Dr. Alakati, but very you know, briefly, patients with metabolic syndrome have always shown a more salt sensitive phenotype than patients who are lean. They are more likely to drop their blood pressures here in the red when you give them a low salt diet, and they are more likely to raise their blood pressure when they're put on a high salt diet. And we think that a large part of that salt sensitivity is due to an overactive renal angiotensin aldosterone system in these individuals. If you just take a profile of resistant hypertensive patients, this is a study that was really just looking at resistant hypertension, and they didn't make too much of the fact that there were some key commonalities in their patients. This is if you're just doing a close examination of their table one, but you can see that the majority of the patients with resistant hypertension have BMIs above 30, that's the average BMI of 33, have high aldosterone levels, 13, have high urinary aldosterone levels, also 13. And remember, more than 12 micrograms per 24 hours urinary aldosterone excretion is criteria for biochemically overt aldosteronism. So in this study of resistant hypertension, the average patient is obese with hyperaldosteronism. It's just what we just reviewed. So the key points, if you're going to say, I'm going to start with the renal angiotensin aldosterone system blocking agent, you have some rationale. One is that modern humans don't need such an active renal angiotensin aldosterone system as the one that we've inherited from our ancestors because we're eating so much salt. Number two is that we know that if you're a hypertensive patient, you have a high chance of having 
relative hyperaldosteronism, and in turn, that means there's a relative high renin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. So again, there's a hormonal system that's overactive. We could think about blocking it. And this is particularly important in patients who are obese with metabolic syndrome and at risk for cardiovascular disease, which, as I said, statistically could be one out of every three patients you see. And if you're a nephrologist, we know this is going to be important to use renangiotensin aldosterone system blocking agents in anybody with chronic kidney disease. So there were some old guidelines which said you could use first-line therapy with an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, but only in non-black hypertensive populations. If you are still looking at those guidelines, I would encourage you to just erase those lines. Don't even think about it. We no longer advocate for this sort of race-based prescription of medications. We know that race is a social construct. There's no reason to choose medications based on whether or not um, someone is identifying or you as a clinician are identifying them as black or non-black. So I always get asked this question, so I put this in here as, well, can we still use an ACE or an ARB in a patient who's black? The answer is don't look at the patient as whether they're black or non-black. Think about the physiology that you think is at play, and regardless of what race they're identifying or you might be identifying them, you should just treat based on physiology. So forget about what the old guidelines say about whether or not these agents can be used in specific populations. Let's go back to Sprint for a second because I just told you that there's a great case for starting with a diuretic and there's a great case for starting with a renangiotensin aldosterone system blocking agent. So what Sprint says, and this is a very recent reanalysis of Sprint. So this is looking at not just did the patients meet those intensive blood pressure goals, but which drugs were used to get to those blood pressure goals. And as you can see, the group that actually experienced the best benefit are the groups that use diuretics and renangiotensin aldosterone system blocking agents to get to those intensive blood pressure controls. So yes, the main message of Sprint was lower blood pressure targets led to better outcomes. And that's what the study was powered for. But when you do subgroup analysis, it appears that the group that really had the best benefit from those lower blood pressure targets were the groups that relied on diuretics and renangiotensin aldosterone system blocking agents to get to those targets. So we also don't just have physiology telling us we should be starting with these drugs. We also have really good data from Sprint that's suggesting that these are the right drugs to start with. It doesn't mean you can never use a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker, but it means if you're thinking about first-line agents, these are the two that I think have the best physiology and um, clinical trial data to support that decision. Now, you may say, well, you made such a compelling case for diuretics, and then you made such a compelling case for ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Can't I use both? And yes, you absolutely can use both. And there are actually some situations where you should use both right from the start. For starters, the majority of hypertensive patients will need more than one blood pressure agent in their lifetime. In fact, it's something like 80% of patients with hypertension will eventually need two or more medications. So it's more likely than not by a large degree that your patients will need more than one medication. And there are some synergies between drug combinations that justify combining them right off the bat. So if you look at this very old, very old chart, which compares the prevalence of hypertension and the average daily salt intake, you can see that as you go from populations that eat less amounts of salt to higher amounts of salt, there's more and more hypertension. So you could look at this chart and make a great case that these patients all need diuretics. But you could also look at this chart and make a great case that all these patients need ACE inhibitors or ARBs to overcome a renangiotensin aldosterone system that should be maximally suppressed as salt is added and added and added to the diet. So we know that our lifestyles are essentially calling for both of these drugs. So one of the ways you can sort of think about which drugs you can use and which drug might be more effective if you're saying, well, I'm on the fence. Should I start with an ACE or an ARB or should I start with a diuretic? Is to do something called renin profiling. And what renin profiling does is it looks at plasma renin activity. And if it's low, then the, the renin is being suppressed by volume expansion. Now, it can be overt volume expansion. You can have an edematous patient. Or it can be occult volume expansion. You can have someone with no edema on exam, but if renin is suppressed, something has to be suppressing that. And 
If renin is suppressed, it would call for the use of what's called an anti-volume drug or an anti-V drug. And those are essentially going to be diuretics. Now, some of the um, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, because they have endothelial vasodilatory properties, can also be considered anti-V drugs. But the majority of the anti-V drugs that you're going to start with would be diuretics. Conversely, if you do renin profiling and the plasma renin activity is elevated, then that's a sign that you have a hyperactive renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And there you're going to want to use what's called an anti-R drug or an anti-renin drug, which are primarily going to be ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Very rare to see people using uh, renin inhibitors anymore. So again, you, you could use renin profiling if you're on the fence, which one should I start with? But if you're saying, I think I'm going to use both, is there a, is there a route to use both? Well, the, the recommendation is that if the blood pressure is more than 20 millimeters of mercury systolic or 10 millimeters of mercury diastolic above goal, then you're going to almost always need two drugs to get to goal. And in that case, using a combination would be a, an appropriate initial strategy. And in fact, if you look at the American Society of Hypertension preferred combinations, it's essentially an anti-R drug with an anti-V drug. So diuretics with an ACE inhibitor, diuretics with an angiotensin receptor blocker, or a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like amlodipine with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So again, using physiology here, let's go after volume, let's go after the renangiotensin aldosterone system. Makes perfect sense based on the physiology we reviewed earlier in the lecture. What we know about fixed-dose combinations of antihypertensive agents is that they are associated with better blood pressure reduction than taking the pills separately. And it's primarily through increased compliance or adherence to the regimen because it's one pill versus multiple pills. So there is a very good rationale just from like behavioral economics to use a fixed dose combination rather than prescribing the drugs separately. And now with so many of these agents being uh, generic, there's not even a cost factor. It's, it's equally inexpensive to give a fixed dose combination than to give uh, individual drugs separately. So for combinations, if you want to start right away with a combination beyond the physiology that you like the story of going after the salt excreting defect and you like the story of going after the hyperactive renangitensin aldosterone system at the same time, you also know from an epidemiologic standpoint that most patients, about 80% of hypertensive patients, will require two or three drugs during their lifetime. And for patients who are coming to you right off the bat with blood pressures that are above goal, um, then you clearly have a, uh, a, a reason to start at their more than 20 over 10 above the recommended guidelines. And I also think even if they're not exactly at that 20 over 10 above goal, if they have you know, the right type of comorbidity. So for example, a chronic kidney disease patient where you know diuresis will be helpful and you know that renangitensin aldosterone system blockade has been associated with approved outcomes. Again, you have a rationale to use a fixed dose combination right off the bat. Now, the fish are reminding me that I should not forget about diet and lifestyle modifications. And the truth is, this is where we should have started. But it's not as sexy to say, let's talk about managing lifestyle versus using medications. But this is actually the starting point before you use medications. If you look at any guideline in terms of how you should treat antihypertensive uh, strategies, they all essentially start with promoting optimal lifestyle habits and using non-pharmacologic therapy before you start going to drugs. It's incredibly important because while this may not be the fix itself for hypertension, it will drastically reduce the amount of medication you have to use for your patient. And it's, it's incredibly important in terms of getting the patient to buy into the importance of non-pharmacologic therapy. So I showed you this slide earlier just on the effects of sodium restriction and just reminding you that even a mild hypertensive will get good benefit from salt restriction. And of course, the worse the hypertension is, the more benefit they'll get from salt restriction. But beyond salt restriction, you can recommend a vegetarian diet if patients want to further modify their diet to reduce blood pressure. And we think that the reason why a vegetarian diet might help blood pressure, beyond the fact that vegetarian diets tend to be less salty than omnivorous diets, um, they also produce less uric acid, uh, 
And we know that uric acid has the ability to lead to endothelial activation and vasoconstriction. So there might be some good physiology beyond just the, the, the lower salt in vegetarian diets. It may be due to less of an oxidative stress um, that the uric acid in, in a meat-eating diet would engender. Exercise, of course, is a key part of lowering blood pressure. So obviously, the more exercise you do, the better you'll see with blood pressure results. So this is showing um, the benefits of high-level recreational exercise. But it turns out, really, any exercise, moderate exercise, will also lead to very impressive reductions in blood pressure compared to inactivity. And then there are even more creative ways we can think about trying to use diet and lifestyle modifications to improve blood pressure outcomes in our patients. This is a study from the New England Journal about four years ago where they looked at blood pressure reduction in a, in a population of uh, black hypertensive patients and they enlisted barber shops and the barbers themselves to encourage patients to work with pharmacists at getting to an optimal blood pressure regimen. And what they found was that by using the, the barbershop intervention, where in turn they referred to a pharmacist, they saw incredible reductions in blood pressure. Now, even just having the barber talk to the patient about blood pressure without referring to a pharmacist led to good drops in blood pressure. But the barber followed by a pharmacist or so working in conjunction um, actually led to significant drops in blood pressure. Now, they used more blood pressure medicine, but they got far better blood pressure results. And this is a very recent study, which I thought was fascinating, where we always talk about, you know, what do we do with some genetic information? Does it actually motivate patients, even if we don't have a therapy? So this is looking at a gene called APOL-L1, which is a gene that's seen in patients of African ancestry that increases the risk for kidney disease. There currently is no therapy directed against the, the product of this gene, although one is being tested in trials. So right now, if we make this uh, genetic diagnosis, what we tell patients is that you are at a higher risk for kidney failure compared to someone without, the, without this genotype. But what they found was that by doing the genotype and then telling the patients that they had this genotype, they found that by, by just that information of the genetic testing, patients seem to be motivated to be more compliant with their medications and their lifestyle changes and led to better blood pressure reduction um, compared to those who were told they did not have the high-risk genotype. So um, very interesting result. If you were told that you had a low-risk genotype, you basically did the same as if you never got genetic testing. But if you were told that you had the high-risk genotype, your blood pressure reduction was significantly better. And so all of this information that we're talking about is basically leading to the idea of, well, what do I do for the patient, not just the patient who I'm seeing for the first time with high blood pressure, but for the patients who come to me and they just can't get to a blood pressure goal. You know, like I'm, I'm trying my hardest and I'm throwing one medicine after another, after another, and they just can't get to goal. So, I mean, one thing you could do is you could go to an algorithm and you could go blind trying to read the algorithm and make yourself crazy trying to follow their arrows. I don't recommend that. What I recommend instead is to think about what we talked about and think about the physiology that drives hypertension. We spent a lot of time today talking about the role of volume expansion and an overactive renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We didn't talk too much about the role of the sympathetic nervous system, but clearly if that's overactive, that too can, can drive hypertension. So the idea is that if you want an algorithm to treat your hypertensive patients, specifically those who aren't responding to your initial efforts of blocking volume with the diuretic or an anti-V drug and blocking renangitensin aldosterone system with an ACE or an ARB or an anti-R drug, then just keep thinking about the physiology throughout. Am I still seeing clinical clues of volume excess? Am I seeing instead clinical clues of a neurogenic hypertension? But if you let physiology guide you, it's actually a very simple way to manage these hypertensive patients. It actually gives you rationale for all of your treatment choices, not just your initial treatment choices, but all the subsequent treatment choices. So that's why I think hypertension management can be such an, an exciting and rewarding field for us because we have explanations for why our patients are becoming hypertensive, uh, hypertensive, and we can use those explanations to actually make a good justification for each agent that we're picking. And if we're doing our job correctly, we're then communicating to our, to our patients why we're choosing these agents. So you can make a good case to start with the diuretic. You can make a good case 
to start with the rain antitensin aldosterone system blocking drug. You can make a case to start with both in combination. And of course, while you're doing that, you know it's important to stress diet and lifestyle modifications. And as your patients continue to follow, and if they become more and more resistant, keep making the case, keep using physiology to justify your subsequent drug choices.